guys and welcome to Heart of Gastro. In today's video, we'll be discussing Hepatitis E and this will be the last video in our viral hepatitis series. So let's get started. So before we get into the specifics of Hepatitis E itself, let's do a quick review on what is Hepatitis. So Hepatitis is the inflammation of the tissue of the liver. The most common cause of this disease is by a viral infection However, this disease can also occur secondary to heavy alcohol intake, certain medications, toxins, other infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and also a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis form, which is basically liver inflammation and damage that is caused by a buildup of fat in the liver. So if you look at my picture on the left, we see our healthy liver above, and below we can see an inflamed liver. So this is actually what hepatitis is. Hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver. So from the definition, we also get that the causes of hepatitis are quite broad. So most commonly, hepatitis is caused by viral infections. However, the disease can also occur from medications, toxins. We can also have an autoimmune form and we can also have a non-alcoholic form, which is caused by fatty buildup in the liver. So now that we know what hepatitis is, let's take a close look at the viral causes of hepatitis. So viral hepatitis is classified into five different types because each of them express different symptoms and require different forms of treatments. So there are five main types of viral hepatitis. They are hepatitis virus type A, type B, type C, type D, and type E. So I have done videos on A, B, C, and D, and in today's video, we're just going to focus on hepatitis virus type E. So what is hepatitis E? The hepatitis E disease is caused by the hepatitis E virus. The virus is spread primarily by fecal oral transmission and according to the World Health Organization, around 20 million cases of hepatitis E infections occur each year and it is more common in developing countries. Although hepatitis E often causes an acute and self-limiting infection because the virus usually resolves itself and the individual recovers, it bears a high risk of developing chronic hepatitis in immune compromised patients and in this case may even result in death. So in my picture below, we have a picture showing the structure of the hepatitis E virus. So the hepatitis E virus is an RNA virus and is spread primarily by fecal oral transmission. That means that viral particles are present in an infected individual's feces and when we come into contact with someone's feces, we are able to get the disease. So now that we know what hepatitis E is, let's take a closer look at the causes of hepatitis E. So what are the causes of hepatitis E? The most common cause is drinking contaminated water. This is more common in developing countries. So if you look at my picture on the left, you see here it says underdeveloped countries and we have a sewage system that is able to infect water sources that go to plants, animals, as well as other human beings and in this way the disease is primarily spread. So when a person has hepatitis E, their stool contains many viral particles and these viral particles are actually able to stay alive in the water and soil and when they come into contact with a host such as an animal or a human, they are able to thrive again. So in this way the hepatitis E virus survives, replicates and infects many people. So another cause is eating undercooked pork or wild game such as deer and this is more common in developed countries. So developed countries usually don't have the problem of drinking contaminated water but they do have the problem when they come into contact with animals that may be infected. The ingestion of raw or uncooked shellfish and this may be a source of sporadic cases in endemic areas. The disease may also occur if one receives a transfusion of infected blood products and there may also be vertical transmission from a pregnant woman to her fetus. So now let's talk about some signs and symptoms of hepatitis E. The incubation period occurs following exposure to the hepatitis E virus. This incubation period ranges from 2 to 10 weeks with an average of about 5 to 6 weeks. The infected individual is believed to excrete the virus around 3 to 4 weeks after the onset of the disease. Most individuals infected with hepatitis E may have no symptoms and this is because the disease is usually acute and self-limiting and this was also said in our definition from the first slide if you remember. So some people have symptoms from day 15 to 60 after they become infected with the virus. 
So because the disease has an incubation period of about 2 to 10 weeks, symptoms will not appear during this incubation period. So because the disease has an incubation period of about 2 to 10 weeks post initial infection, no symptoms will be able to be seen at this time. Signs and symptoms will only start to occur once the virus has taken full effect in the body and is replicating and invading our body's cells. So usually signs and symptoms may not be present, but if they are, they may include sudden nausea and vomiting, having abdominal pain or discomfort, especially in the right upper side beneath the lower ribs, and this is where the liver is located in the body. They may also experience clay-colored bowel stools and dark urine. They may experience loss of appetite and fatigue, a low-grade fever and joint pain, a yellowing of their skin and the whites of their eyes, and this is a process called jaundice, they may also experience intense itching or encephalopathy. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of hepatitis E. So an elevation in the serum alanine aminotransferase level as well as the bilirubin levels can help us with the diagnosis of a hepatitis E. So if you remember in the slide before this, we said that the disease has an incubation period of about two to 10 weeks with an average of five to six weeks. So that is very important because as you see, that is where most of the action on our graph here actually begins. So after this two week period, we will see a peak in the ALT levels, and this can be seen in this blue line here. So the ALT will increase, and ALT is an enzyme that is released from the liver, and this sort of tells us that there's some sort of stress in the liver, or the liver is undergoing some sort of failure. So because the virus is going to invade the liver and attack it, and the liver is not going to be able to perform any of its normal functions because of the inflammatory process, it's going to send out these ALT enzymes. So the ALT is usually coupled with a few other enzymes, which are the AST and the GGT, and these may all increase. So the bilirubin levels will also increase, and this is not in the graph, but you can look out for that in the blood report. So the serology studies for the hepatitis E infection include the detection of IgM and IgG anti-HEV antibodies and the detection of HEV RNA. So the IgM anti-HEV antibodies can be detected during the first few months after the HEV infection, whereas the IgG anti-HEV antibodies represent either a recent or remote exposure. So after the initial infection, we will see peaks in the IgM anti-HEV, and this can be seen in this dark blue line here. We see the peaking of this IgM anti-HEV. We also see the peaking of the IgG, which is seen in red here, and this will be peaked whether the patient has a recent or a previous infection that occurred a long time ago. So the presence of the HEV RNA indicates a current infection, whether it is acute or chronic, and the HEV RNA levels in serum or plasma are usually detectable in all infected individuals by about three weeks after the infection. So as we see here, we see the HEV in stool, but it can also be present in the blood. And this is actually how we can diagnose the hepatitis E for sure, is if we find the HEV RNA, which is the genetic makeup of the virus. So the HEV will be present in the stool as well as the plasma and the HEV in the stool is actually responsible for the transmission of the disease because as we spoke about earlier, that HEV in stool enters and contaminates water as well as plant and animal life and this is how the disease is primarily transmitted. So basically to wrap up this slide, the most important things in the diagnosis of hepatitis E, we will have the increased ALT levels, AST, GGT, as well as an increase in bilirubin. We will also see the IgM and then IgG increase in the blood. And we will also see the HEV RNA in the stool as well as the blood plasma. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of hepatitis E. So no specific treatment for acute hepatitis E is currently known. The recovery from symptoms following infection may take several weeks or months, and the medications which are prescribed are aimed at maintaining comfort and adequate nutritional balance, including the replacement of fluids lost from vomiting and diarrhea. The patient is advised to avoid alcohol and the use of certain medications, and this is because the liver will have difficulty processing medications and alcohol, and this can also cause more liver damage. So certain medications and alcohol are actually toxic to the liver because the liver is actually involved in the metabolization of these products 
And if the liver is under stress or in any difficulty, we don't want to stress the liver out more, so we actually avoid alcohol and certain medications. We may choose rubavirine as a first-line therapy for severe chronic hepatitis E virus infections, and this is advisable, especially in solid organ transplant patients. We can also administer pegylated interferon alpha, and this has been used successfully for the treatment of hepatitis E, but is associated with major side effects such as cholestasis. And in patients whose liver failure is so complete that it has led to encephalopathy or cerebral edema, a timely liver transplantation is often the only option. So the more serious patients that are affected with the hepatitis E virus is actually the immune compromised patients such as patients undergoing chemotherapy or patients who are suffering from AIDS or HIV. So their body will not be able to properly fight the virus and this is where we need to administer drugs such as rubavirine or pegylated interferon to help them fight the virus. But if a normal healthy individual contracts the hepatitis E virus, no real specific treatment is really needed. And now I just want to say a few words about the vaccination for hepatitis E. So no worldwide approved vaccine is currently available against the hepatitis E virus. And the only vaccine that is commercially available is the HEV-239 vaccine, which is called Hecolin, and this has been registered in China for use since 2011. This was implemented after a large-scale phase 3 study involving more than 100 Chinese adults who were reported that the recombinant HEV vaccine, HEV-239, prevented acute hepatitis E with a vaccine efficacy of 94 to 100%. The vaccine, however, is not yet being approved in other countries. And that brings us to the end of this video on Hepatitis E. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. If you'd like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.